Mm. So we're told, you know, how to come to a correct understanding of what the text says, but but we're not told how to actually discern what to what to apply and appropriate to ourselves. And I think that is that has become real obvious. Um, mm. That 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 limitation would become real obvious within the pandemic. So just to bring that mm. that into here, yeah, um, the governments around the world shut down churches right and i can tell you in australia the majority of churches in the country have been shut down by the government since march 2020 last year the majority of churches in this country have been shut down forced closed by the government since 2020 and it's not like wow and, and and it's not as if okay you can still meet in small groups the all Christian ministries have been forced shut down. Pastors are not allowed to visit their parishioners. Um, I mean, it's 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 a complete shutdown of Christian ministry. Just not wild. just of a not just of a Sunday worship of a church with two hundred or more people. Um, this is the majority of churches in the country since March two thousand and twenty. Um, well, if if churches had a, and, and the churches in Australia have have no clue what to do, in my opinion, yeah, <laughs> they they've no idea what to do. podcast with Adam Robinson, September 2021. Uh, This is a year and a half ago, and you might be wondering, why did I wait so long to release it? Well, first, before I answer that question, how about a word from our sponsor? Fund the Nations helps individuals, organizations, and churches raise money for missions, adoptions, and nonprofits by custom designing, high-quality, low-cost t-shirts, and other apparel to use for fundraising. They have great custom design work and incredible customer service. Everyone wears t-shirts, so give them one that helps you accomplish your calling. At Fund the Nations, they always say money shouldn't determine your vision, just fund it. With no money required up front, it's a no-risk fundraiser. So get $20 off your first order by using the code CROSSROADS when you contact them. Let Fund the Nations help you fulfill your calling. I also want to uh, ask you, if you're a regular listener to this podcast, uh, that um, I want to make this request that if you really enjoy this podcast, there are a couple of things you can do to spread its reach. And obviously, the reach of podcasts is largely dependent on listeners like you. So a number of things you can do is first, you can subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you use, such as Apple Podcasts, Anchor, Spotify, YouTube, and that will make sure you receive notifications when an episode comes online. Also, you can go onto Apple Podcasts and give the podcast a five-star rating. The more ratings on Apple Podcasts, the more visibility for the podcast. And lastly, it would be helpful if you shared the podcast on your social media account. Maybe that's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Truth Social, whatever you use. Another way you can support this podcast is by purchasing items from the affiliate links below. Often, those are books that I'll recommend uh, from things we discussed on the podcast. Also, uh, one more thing I haven't mentioned actually yet is that recently my podcast has been brought into the Christian podcast community, and it's exciting to be a part of this community of Christian podcasters. You can learn more about this podcasting community at podcasts.strivingforeternity.org, and you can become acquainted with so many excellent podcasts, so be sure to subscribe to their channel on whatever podcasting platform you use. Now... To answer your question, why did I wait to release this podcast a year and a half later? In part, it's because of how strict the social media world was back then, talking about this major global and political event we call the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm sure me saying the word, some AI just picked up on it and it's been flagged. Oh well. Uh, Things have loosened a little bit, but I wanted to be sure to bring this podcast to you because I think what Adam has to say in this podcast, not only about his expertise in hermeneutics, but in that is an application and appropriation of the text, but it applies to what we talked about, the COVID-19 pandemic. I wanted to release it then, but I know they were putting strikes on YouTube channels and um, banning content. So I figured, why not? Let's risk it. Things have lightened up a little bit. 
So in this podcast, I learned a whole lot about Socialist Australia. That's right, Socialist Australia. And this isn't an exaggeration or desire to be pejorative or bombastic. Um, Here, right here in this podcast, you get to hear from a citizen of Australia, Adam Robinson, someone I went to seminary with, but he's also a PhD in New Testament hermeneutics. We talk about his expertise in applying the Bible to the COVID uh, pandemic in particular is how we show he he really does demonstrate his expertise on application and hermeneutics. It's really a fascinating conversation. And he talks about a lot of the tragedies that have been taking place within the country of uh, 25 million people. It really is a fascinating conversation. So after listening to this podcast, if you really enjoyed it, let us know in the comments if we should uh, have Adam back on to see if Australia has improved or it's gotten worse during the pandemic. Thanks for listening. Now, let's dive in. Well, welcome to another episode of the At the Crossroads with Travis McNeely podcast. This is a, a podcast where we seek to help people think and help them think biblically about the issues that they're facing. And we talk about a wide variety of topics. And today, uh, I have the pleasure of having actually an old friend with me that we got reacquainted this past year in 2021, Adam Robinson. Adam is 37 years old. He's been a Christian since he was 19. He's been married to Sarah for nine years and has three children with one on the way. Congratulations, brother. Fill in the quiver. Thank Fill you. in the quiver. <laughs> and right. uh, you're, you got a PhD from Southwestern, where we're both graduates from, a PhD in New Testament with a minor in Old Testament. And mm-hmm. currently, uh, Adam, you're a lecturer of biblical studies and biblical languages at New Life College in Robina, Australia. Did I say that right, Robina? That, that is correct. Yes. Awesome. Well, um, Man, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you on the podcast and even just our emails back and forth every time it just excited me, just like, whoa, I'm learning new stuff here. And uh, just why don't you tell us a little bit about um, your PhD and what your studies in and, and what you teach? Sure. Um, so PhD is a New Testament. My focus was on the book of Revelation and my, uh, my dissertation specifically was on the sexual immorality language uh, within the book of Revelation. So there was really no consistency as to what john was doing with that language and so i wrote the definitive and (laughs) hopefully definitive um you know book on on what he's doing with that language uh one of the reasons i chose revelation was twofold number one it's one of the more confusing books in the bible uh therefore if i'm going to pay money to to study and learn i might as well study and learn something i'm not familiar with go on Um, but that's exactly right use your money wisely Uh, (laughs) But also the uh, revelation alludes to the Old Testament and uses the Old Testament more than any other book in the New Testament. And mm-hmm. I really think it's, it's, it's important for, for pastors and Christians and scholars, biblical scholars, to have a robust knowledge of both Testaments mm-hmm. um, and how they relate to each other and so forth. So doing, uh, doing this dissertation on revelation had me in the Old Testament a lot Wow. Um, and so that shouldn't surprise you that hermeneutics, biblical hermeneutics, uh, sometimes called biblical interpretation, is, is definitely an area of, of concern, but also uh, enjoy, enjoyment for me. I love, love that area. Um, yeah. And so that's kind of what I do at New Life. So it's a really small college. Uh, I teach all the Bible courses. So okay. Old Testament, New Testament, the surveys. Um, hermeneutics, uh, the more focused courses. So, you know, like the book of Revelation, I recently um, uh, finished one there. And then some other random courses, uh, such as where well, I had to teach a, a course on Bible and culture. Okay. And that's how I really, how we connected actually was, yep. was um, that one of my, my sessions was on suffering. And hmm. what does culture say about, su- about suffering as in the causes of suffering and how to overcome suffering. Hmm. And yeah. one of the primary causes of suffering being, uh, being taught and uh, um, believed throughout the Western world over the last few years is related to critical theory um, that we are all oppressed and it is the oppressors that are that are causing all of the the pain and the suffering in our lives and so that's how i kind of got really connected with with critical theory yeah. well man well a couple things you mentioned the book of revelation and uh funny enough i just started a bible study tonight with our college students in revelation i figured hey it looks like the end of the world every time i turn on the news why not so uh, no but uh i'm also like i also go when i ask you all these questions about revelation now but that's not why we're also meeting today, but that's really cool. 
um, that that's what you did your PhD. And I guess we'll have to have further conversations. Maybe we hold the same view. Maybe we don't. What, what's your view of Revelation? Just real, like one minute. I'm, a, I, 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 I'm closest to the historic premillennialist camp. Okay. Okay. So George Ladd, if he's the one who coined the term is George Ladd, GE Ladd. Um, and so that's, that's where I'm at. That's right. I remember reading Ladd and Hoskins class. So that was great. Um, uh, well, uh, I am a, uh, currently, I say currently cause it could change. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm meeting with you now, so I could totally change. Um, but, uh, I am a classical dispensationalist. I actually got to take an eschatology class with Charles Ryrie and when I was a young wow. believer. Yeah. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. And uh, he actually even came to my dorm room and did dorm devotions. It was really fascinating. Um, really great guy, kind guy. And I respect him a lot, you know, read his basic theology. Uh, but, you know, I've encountered a lot of other views since then. And it's not that I haven't, um, I could be persuaded other ways, but I just, uh, I guess I haven't been persuaded, but I'm not like argumentative, like, I'm going to die on this hill of classical dispensationalism. I, I kind of feel like I am being tempted toward progressive dispensationalism a little bit. But I really um, thought you were going to say you're a progressive dispensationalist <laughs> because Craig Blazing was the provost while yeah. we were at Southwestern. Yep. Paige Patterson followed in suit who wrote his, his NAC commentary on, on Revelation from a progressive dispensationalist perspective. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah cur currently, I'm reading Marvin Pate's. Uh, it's a small little book on interpretation of apocalyptic literature and it was uh it's it's actually even get challenged me on the olivet discourse stuff on and in the rapture and things like that and i'm like oh no my classical dispensationalist beliefs are falling apart so i gotta read some contrary <laughs> stuff uh but no it's exciting because you know the word of god is such a you know i mean we i taught the first three verses tonight and you think about of revelation and the blessing that revelation is so um to read it uh, read it aloud and study it to hear it and to keep it you know and so it's just exciting man just to be able to dive into that with our college students and and I, I try to teach the multi-view approach. So I try to say, this is what this view teaches and that and this as we move along. So it'll be a slow going, but I'm excited for it. And I guess I need to get a hold of your dissertation. Um, but uh, <laughs> so, so to critical theory, though, you know, you said you're teaching this Bible and culture class and they're talking about suffering and oppression. And, uh, you know, as we think about, um, you know, hermeneutics and the influence of critical theory on hermeneutics. Um, what are some ways in which maybe not now, let's not, we'll go to now in a minute. Um, but in the history of hermeneutics and Bible interpretation, where do we see critical theory start making its inroads into um, Christianity and hermeneutics? In the, in the academic world, I would say it would probably be around the 1980. Um, but that hasn't spilled over and become a lot more. It, hasn't, it, it became really popular at the turn of the millennium mm -hmm. um, is when it really became a lot more popular. Um, and so around 1980, um, feminist interpretations were becoming increasingly popular. They were around beforehand, but it, it was gaining a lot of momentum. Uh, post-colonialism and post-colonial yeah. interpretations were, were, were gaining uh, a lot of momentum. And really this was all cemented and secured and, and quite the popular thing by the new millennium by, by 2000. And it's still, it's still all the rage. It's just expanded a lot um, as culture has, a, has, has adopted critical theory thinking, uh, biblical studies, uh, that field of biblical studies and hermeneutics within that has adopted it as well. And so now you see, um, you know, there's homosexual interpretations and, um, and, you know, you know, queer interpretation and just, you name it, it it's just really broadened and, and so forth. And whatever group you identify with, uh, you can now interpret the Bible from that perspective, um, yeah. usually for the goal of liberation or emancipation. Hmm. Yeah, it seems to be the two goals. Um, so, um in our emails, you mentioned to me a guy named uh, Jurgen Habermas and, and his role in critical theory and speech and discourse. Why don't you talk to us about how that's affected hermeneutics in particular um, and just kind of break that down and, um, and maybe give some examples of that? Yeah, so Habermas is, is second generation Frankfurt School. Um, and where, where he sort of staked his claim was, in short, by advocating that all speech and discourse, be it spoken or written, is systematically distorted. It's, it's, it's all systematically distorted. 
And so within neo-Marxism and critical theology, uh, critical theory is a neo-Marxist theory, unapologetically (laughs) neo-Marxist. So that's not a pejorative um, or whatnot, that it is unapologetically, openly neo-Marxist. So within that uh, within that that system, so brief brief summary of the system for those not familiar. You've got your your base, which consists of the means of production, so everything that is that is produced. Um, the the those who control the means of production, so basically the rich, <laughs> the yeah. rich and the powerful, um, they determine the superstructure, which is which reflects the the interests of the ruling class. And so the superstructure uh, consists of important for us religion, um, ideology, the political systems, uh, what else, the legal system, and Habermas included uh, discourse, speech. Mm-hmm. Uh, within that and so the superstructure is what oppresses and keeps the average joe the blue collar worker those who are not part of the ruling class oppressed so you've got all of these these areas that are keeping the people oppressed um, and one of them is speech and discourse Um, it is designed um, it is used as a tool by the rich and powerful by the the elite by the ruling class to keep everyone oppressed and basically to keep their status as, as ruler and your status as servant to, uh, to them and their whims. Hmm. Um, and so he, he put that, that argument forward and said, then the goal, uh, the hermeneutical goal of whenever you're trying to interpret and assess any kind of discourse, be it spoken or written, is again, emancipation. And so he is looking for a dominance free discourse in society okay um so again a a a way of speaking to one another and writing that is completely devoid of any sort of power power structure um, or terminology that's going to keep somebody oppressed or not oppressed Uh, so does it normally like it i mean it just when I hear that, it reminds me of a little bit of the modern Malu. And I, I do want to stay in history and talk about the development of this, but it's almost hard not to talk about today. Uh, I just think about how there's so many people who talk about speech being violence. Uh, you see the protesters and signs like that. But it's I almost want to ask them the question sometimes, like, what do what do they expect? Like in the sense of if they're going to fight and say speech is violence, so they want to stop speech, what speech will take its place? And it seems like they're the ones who've, almost invented this new type of hate speech in a way, or at least they're trying to restrict speech because speech can be oppressive. And it's, it's like, there's no neutrality. There isn't it's neutrality is a myth, but you know, I wonder if the protesters are cognizant that they're becoming, if, if they're, if they're in truly advocating for the oppressed, that they're actually becoming oppressors. If they see that, I mean, what do you think about that? So I think that's sort of where critical theory ends up. Um, let me just first say, Habermas himself didn't think it was possible to have dominance-free language, um, okay. except in utopia. So he never saw it as, he sees it as the goal and we should always strive for it. But unless, until we enter utopia, he never actually thought it was really going to be possible. <laughs> um, okay. So I figured that out. But that, in my opinion, is the ultimate one of the ultimate flaws of critical theory. So critical yeah. theory splits everyone in the world into two groups, the oppressed and, uh, sorry, the oppressed down here and the oppressors yeah. up here. And so the goal of, of critical theory is emancipation or liberation of the oppressed. Now, the question is though, how are they actually, that there's no room for pure equality right. um, in, in my opinion. Because how do they go about emancipating themselves from the oppressors? The only way they're going about emancipating themselves from the oppressors is oppressing the oppressors. Hmm. And with a worldview where there is never and never has been any, any time in history where there has been no oppressors and no oppressed, how can we ever expect there to ever be within this within this theory? Yeah. And when you look at the, you know, you just you look at the way 
look at Black Lives Matter, which is which is really a great a great example. Well, what are yeah. they, who are, who are the who are the oppressors? The oppressors are generally the white heterosexual males. So if for just for sake of argument, we can say the oppressed are the exact opposite of that black homosexual females. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, so they're the ultimate op- oppressed um, oppressed. Well, liber- what does liberation look like for them? If you look at the actual actions of Black Lives Matter and anyone who adheres to critical theory, it's not complete equality. It is getting the oppressed are now have been now become the oppressors and they will end up oppressing their oppressors. And now the system, does that now mean once I am now oppressed because I am a white heterosexual male, does that now mean I am, I am the oppressed and now you are setting up your new superstructure based mm. on your ideology, um, based on your laws and legal system, uh, which we're already seeing, the whole defund the police. Yeah. Uh, that is part of their, their ideology and that's part of them tra- transforming the legal system. Um, the 1619 project, which wants to get rid of the constitution completely, that makes total sense because the constitution was made by white heterosexual males. Uh, therefore, mm. we've got to completely get rid of it. But now, once you have taken control of the superstructure and are filtering through all of your religion and your ideologies and your um, and your laws and so forth, well, then that's going to oppress another group that's not you. By, by its very nature, if it reflects only your values of that identity, then it's going to oppress another group. And it's, in my opinion, it's a never ending cycle. Um, it just depends. Each generation um, or each era has a different oppressor under the system and a different oppressed uh, people group. And so I don't ever think it will end in utopia. Yeah. Um, you know, it usually just stops with we just need to free the oppressed. It never really shows how to have true equality. And they would usually say true equity because critical theorists are after equity, not equality. Right. Um, how, how do you get there? There is no way of coming to, to, to true equity. A dictator, <laughs> at the very least, some kind of a dictator or, or a oppressor is going to come to the fore. And that's the one who's going to oppress the rest of the people. So it's, it's a flawed, it's a flawed theory with a flawed methodology and no real way to come to utopia. Yeah. It's interesting how, you know, it doesn't fit with the way the world is and they acknowledge it, but they still stick with it. You know, Habermas, you know, he wants to employ this dominance free communication, but he also acknowledges you can never get there, but it's just this endless trying to get there. And it's, it really just kind of seems self-refuting. It's, it's like, you know, I can keep trying to, you know, do X, Y, or Z task, but if I know it's absolutely impossible to get there then why do it? It becomes like it's telos or it's goal becomes completely meaningless. And so, you know, you think about, you know, even the way we've been framing it and talking about it, explaining the framework of the conflict theory of relationships of oppressor and oppressed, you know, we think of the Christian worldview and what it offers. It offers a co- cooperative framework um, that we work together. Uh, and, you know, people talk about wanting unity and harmony and peace. And they say things like no justice, no peace. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I I get, I, I, the words themselves, if you define them from the Christian worldview, I would actually agree with that, you know, in the sense of like, yeah, I'm, I'm only made right with God, you know, uh, I'm only given peace through justification. Sure. You know, I need God's justice to reign and a sovereign to, you know, he completely calls the shots and because he calls the shots and he's going to judge, I can ultimately have PCF yeah, for sure. But of course, what they mean by that is something very different. And it's just really interesting when you think about it. You know, it, if you test it and if you look at the maybe the origins of all of it, they even acknowledge it doesn't work. But we have something that does work. But at the same time, I mean, talking hermeneutics, first Corinthians chapter two, the natural man cannot understand or comprehend the things of God. Uh, and so, you know, we're not going to be surprised that Second Corinthians four four, right? The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers, and so um, they're not going to think logically sometimes, you know. Um, and so, you know, as we think about it, you know, some people have said, uh, and especially as it relates to the Bible, uh, th- things they've been pushing back against uh, patriarchy. For instance, they say things like, um, in some of our notes here that we have, the Bible. One of the things they say is the Bible reinforces the patriarchy through speech 
such as using the masculine pronoun he for God. It also reinforces the patriarchy through other means, such as its representation of women and silencing of women. Men speak more than women in the Bible and its advocacy of male headship. One of the things you brought up a minute ago was the idea of, you know, radical feminism and the ways that it brought in critical theory. You know, it seems even with the Black Lives Matter um, online statement that they took down, but they want to destroy the nuclear family as their goal. I I remember looking at that when they first came out. uh, My pastor, my pastor said, go online to the whole church and, and yeah. look at their values and, and see if these align with, with Christian values. Yeah. And uh, yes, they, there are, there are some, there were, they like you said, you can still find it on the internet, but they took it down after it was be, after I think Fox news started publicizing that they were, they were neo-Marxist and they were unashamedly neo-Marxist until it got hold and everybody started saying, well, this is a bad thing. So they took it down, but yes, yeah. they are. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I think it's it's such a danger because, I I mean, you're in Australia, and you know, I'm in the U.S. Um, from what I can tell, we're a bit more free than you guys, but that's another episode for another day. Uh, but in the Western world, which even though you're on the other side of the world, we'd say ideologically we're all Westerners here. Correct. Um, I really, I don't, I really think the West has fallen. Maybe we haven't felt. The ramifications yet um but i just really get this sense and i'm not like um i'm not saying uh i'm not trying to fear monger or anything like that like i'm not like oh uh, you know but it's like you just think about how i feel like we crossed the point of no return for our culture for a very 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 long time and we're starting to see some signs of that you know you got no fault divorce and so many people are divorced you have so many abortions so many broken families and homes people delaying marriage a very long time, people not having a lot of kids, uh, just a lot of different things, you know, um, in our society, economically, there's a lot of really bad things. Um, and I just kind of see a point of no return. And I, and I, and I sense that even critical theory has a lot to do with it. Um, and we talk about this idea of patriarchy. Um, you know, I know some people, even Christians, even good conservative Christians sometimes have a problem with the term patriarchy. I mean, what do you think about the, that idea of, of biblical patriarchy and um, maybe what we need to think about returning to as a culture, as Christians, and how we might influence the culture? Well, I actually think um, the, problem, the problem with so many of these terms nowadays is they, they come loaded and we can use a term and it might be accurate, but it might not reflect the biblical understanding. So the Bible certainly presents a form of patriarchy the bible and, and by that really the bible presents male headship there, yep. there's no doubt about that the bible prevent, not just presents but advocates for yeah um at all stages in salvation history male headship of the family and male headship of the church hmm. and i will limit my discussion to those two because most yeah. of the bible is speaking about god's people yeah. um and and the family and so i don't think there's much doubt about that um, the interesting thing in biblical hermeneutics and in biblical studies is, and I tell my classes all the time, and they kind of seem shocked until they really think about it. And we go through a number of examples. There's not much disagreement in the biblical studies world as to what the Bible actually says. That's really not where the, the agreement, the disagreement is. The disagreement revolves or revolves around what do I do with it today? What do mm. I do with it? What does the church do it? Basically, it, revol- it revolves around um, application or appropriation. Yeah. Do I appropriate this to my life and the people of God and my church, or do I not for whatever reason? And that's where a lot of the disagreements um, happen. So I, I teach within a, a very liberal denomination. Um, uh, so very uh, the funny thing is the reason i can is because they're a bit more liberal and they're, they're, they're liberal in the sense of they're not conservative but they're also liberal in the sense of they're open to all all ideas including mm. the very conservative ideas so they knew who i was and <laughs> my beliefs and where i studied before they hired me i went through a couple interviews about it um and they're fine for their students to hear from a conservative voice uh but they the denomination in which i in which i teach um, is is completely against complementarianism, completely against it. Even though they 
on in 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 published documents acknowledge that the bible clearly presents complementarianism as the biblical wow. um, way to, you know regarding roles of men and women they're, they're different but they have equal worth and so forth male headship but they say that's a, that's exactly what the bible says but we don't agree with it and to the point where you can't be uh, get ordained in in this denomination if you hold to complementarianism um, and it's the same with homosexuality. They affirm throughout the Old and New Testament that the Bible as a whole is against homosexuality. Um, wow. But the denomination fully affirms homosexuality, even though they agree this is what the Bible actually says. So we're going a 180 from against what the Bible says. Uh, so this is the area, I get really the area of biblical hermeneutics that is the most interesting for many and definitely the most um, controversial is in that area of application appropriation um, and if, if, if I'm to use the uh, the NIV application commentary term bridging the gap <laughs> yeah. Yeah. between what does the text say and what do I do with the text that hermeneutical move that you make to bridge that gap to determine what what actually governs your life um, is really interesting, and there's a lot of debate and a lot of controversy um, within churches, within denominations, within Protestantism, um, and even between different the three major factions of Christianity: Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox. So, wow, you know, I th I think about even just you you saying that it's kind of shocking because it's like they uh. They, they will totally acknowledge the Bible says this. And then they're like, no, but that's not what we believe. And mm -hmm. they call themselves Christians. It's just very shocking to me. Like, uh, um, is it is it rare to find, I guess, because you say you're part of this denomination as well. This is a school. The school that you teach at is this denomination school, like represented. Is that right? Correct. So, yeah. so I teach... So it's interesting. Um, so I currently attend a Baptist church, uh, an okay. independent Baptist church at the moment. Okay. okay. Um, so I don't, but I teach within a different denomination. I see. And so the school is, is a, the, the, the college is a part of a denomination. They have a head college. Okay. Um, and we're a member college in our area. So it's, it's a weird relationship. Yeah. Um, the member college was begun by one of the, the second largest church within that denomination okay um so the, the the where i teach is very much engrossed within the within this denomination interestingly enough the church that started my college is one of the more conservative ones within the denomination hmm. and they have dissented on a number of issues such as homosexuality they said homosexuality is a sin gay marriage is a sin um, transgenderism Good. is not right, even though the denomination as a whole, and it's a hierarchical structure. Okay. Um, so the top tells us this is what our denomination believes and or filters down to all churches. They don't have a choice. But our church, our, the, this church dissented. Um, and so they were really quite happy. Uh, they, they pushed to have me hide, even though I'm more conservative than the church is. They wanted somebody more conservative than who was being brought up from the head college to hmm. teach all their biblical studies courses um, because they were going so far as saying, well, the Bible isn't trustworthy. It's not the word of God. It's not infallible. It's not inerrant. Hmm. Um, and, the, and the denomination believes that as a whole, as, as form in their formal documentations, they do not believe that the Bible is the word of God. Um, but this church does. <laughs> Um, and the church is too large to kick out of the denomination because they bring in too much money. And it, whenever you have a hierarchical structure, money flows from every church into the, the denomination as a whole. And so it's, it's very difficult to boot out a wealthy church. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. As, uh, as the SBC has found out every now and then. Yeah. Um, when, when, uh, so I, yeah. I won't give any examples in the SBC. My buddy right. is a pastor at SBC church and there was a big controversy. Um, I think the church should have gotten kicked out of, you know, out of mm -hmm. um, cooperate fellowship or whatnot, but yeah. they gave a lot to the cooperative program. Yeah. And I think that's the reason that they were allowed to remain. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the SBC didn't do anything about it, but um, yeah, not good. Yeah. Uh, man. Well, um, 
you know, I kind of want to even just hit on a little bit of, uh, you know, some of our mutual interests, maybe because, you know, you think about the role you have as a teacher, you're investing in students' lives, you build relationships with these students. And, you know, I'm sure it's really exciting to kind of be like the only conservative teacher. And you're like, this is a ministry, I get to really pour into people. And as my, my role as a pastor, you know, I get to invest in the lives of students and families and college students. And I just love that opportunity to be able to teach and walk people through God's word. And so just, you know, a little bit about biblical hermeneutics and really trying to help people think about things biblically. Cause you know, we just walked through a lot about critical theory and it's negative impact on hermeneutics and how people will look at the world and interpret the world. But let's kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about it in, in a sense of like just the objectivity of hermeneutics and then how that brings us, you know, how, how do we get to application from there and, you know, so maybe like defining it and then walking through different assumptions that we have. Why don't you just, just help us do that as a, as a PhD who's focused on this kind of stuff, but also you're teaching it to students, you know, for, for those listening, they might be interested in how, how to think rightly. Sure. Sure. Um, the problem really begins with what it, what actually is hermeneutics. Uh, there is no consensus. Um, pick up, pick up five, home, you pick up three hermeneutics books and read their definition um, and it ranges from it's exactly the same as exegesis in that we are just drawing out the meaning. We're just interpreting the Bible. There's no difference between hermeneutics and exegesis. Um, the other, and I, I, I would say I fall more into this camp. They would say hermeneutics is the theory of interpretation. Exegesis is the practice of interpretation. And so um, when you talk about exegetical method, they would say that's hermeneutics, but actually writing the exegetical paper or preaching from the pulpit, this is what this passage means. I'm actually engaged in exegesis then. Um, the hermeneutics is the method for figuring out how to properly interpret the text. And then the, that's probably where I, I lie more because that encompasses everything from what did the text mean to the original readers all the way to application. What does it mean? Um, how do I appropriate it today? I don't like the term, what does it mean today? Um, uh, because that can be confusing, that terminology. And then the yeah. third major understanding is hermeneutics is focused on application or appropriation. And the terminology they would use is what it means today or what it means for me today. Now, really what they mean is how I appropriate it because what the text meant to 1,000 years ago, 2,000 or 2,000 plus years ago, really is what the text still means today. That technically right. should never change. Right. Uh, it's it's more along the lines of well, how do I how do I appropriate it? How do I understand it, or something like that? Um, so, but regardless of where you you how you understand it, um, the the be really the starting point is the most important, and this is what separates at least biblical study scholars into two different camps. The two different types of biblical study scholars are critical scholars and confessional scholars, and that really begins with your presuppositions. Um, confessional scholars have a number of presuppositions before they even open the text of the Bible that theoretically are drawn from the Bible. So it's a bit of a, a, a hermeneutical circle we've got here, yeah. um, but they believe that the Bible is the word of God, not that the word of God is found within the Bible, that it is the word of God itself. Um, they believe that the Bible therefore has authority over the life of the individual, um, the way, not only the individual's beliefs, but the way an individual um, conducts his or her life to how the church is organized and what the church does and so forth. Um, they also assume uh, or presuppose that um, communication is possible, <laughs> that God can communicate to, to man, to humans, um, and that humans can communicate to each other. They assume uh, it, it's both an assumption and a presupposition that there is such a thing as reliable communication, um, whereas critical scholars start from the perspective uh, that the Bible is not the word of God. It's just like a regular human just like a regular um, book written by humans. And then because of that presupposition comes all of this other baggage. Yeah. Um, and so if you agree with Habermas that all language and speech um, is systematically distorted to reinforce the superstructure and the, the wants and desires um, and place of the, the ruling class, 
Well, because it's written by humans, all of a sudden I'm now looking for all of that in it. Hmm. And so um, you can't get a, there is no divine element. And so that's really the starting point for hermeneutics um, hmm. because it will, it might not always change the outcome of what the text actually says. At times it will, but sometimes it won't. But it will definitely change what you actually do with the text. Um, and what you appropriate with it. And there are more assumptions and presuppositions um, that you need to, to work out for yourself. Um, I've got a whole list here, but, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. that revolve the nat- you know, issues about the nature of the Bible, the nature of God, the nature of man, the possibility of, of reliable communication, um, the role of Jesus, if any, in hermeneutics. Mm. Um, so do I need, do I need to be saved to fully understand um scripture you definitely need to be saved i think so but also you need to be saved to actually do what scripture demands of you (laughs) yeah yeah Um, so so you know where what place does salvation have um have within it Uh, and then of course the role of the holy spirit these need to be discerned from from the outset um and and i think that's the starting place Hmm. um and then when it and so so you've got that we can then let's just assume we agree on what the text says. There's still a lot of disagreement even within the evangelical um, community as to what passages apply to us. Even if we believe the Bible is fully the word of God, even if we believe the Bible has full authority over us because it is God's word to us, um, we don't all apply the same passages to ourselves. Hmm. Um, and so I really don't like it when a preacher stands up and preaches something from the Bible and says, we do it just because the Bible says so. And I'm like, mm, okay, then why do you not adhere to the Sabbath? Yeah. Then why is there not a fence around your roof? Yeah. All right. Why did you not stone your child, your adult child who, who was, who was, who was, who was, you know, insulting you and doing, and doing wrong? Um, why do you not offer, offer, offer animal sacrifices? Now, some of these you're probably like, well, I know the answer to that one, yeah. but you see my point. You see right. my point, right? The Bible gives lots of commands. We don't adhere to all of them. Yeah. We, we don't. Yeah. Why do women, and that, I, I listed a lot from the old Testament. I'll, I'll list some from the new Testament. Why do women not cover their heads when they pray? Yeah. Why, yeah. why don't they do it? Now there's no, no command for a holy kiss, but that was certainly the normative practice of all the churches. Why do we not kiss each other anymore? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you've, you've, it's, it's, I, I, I use the word intention. I know it's harsh. I think it's quite ignorant just to say, well, we do this or we don't do this because the Bible told us to or not to do. This is yeah. where a hermeneutic comes in specifically that area of application. Pastors, teachers, and churches need a method for, for applying scripture. There has to be some sort of methodology. And that was the weakness in my hermeneutics course that I took at seminary. Mm-hmm. There was nothing about application or appropriation. Mm-hmm. And I, I was a teaching assistant to two other professors and sat in on those hermeneutics courses. So I've been in three hermeneutics courses with different professors. Yeah. Um, guess what element is severely lacking in all of them? Application, application or appropriation. Mm-hmm. So we're told you know, how to come to a correct understanding of what the text says, but, but we're not told how to actually discern what to, what to apply and appropriate to ourselves. And I think that is, that has become real obvious, um, mm. that, that, that limitation would become real obvious within the pandemic. So just to bring that, mm. that into here, yeah. um, the governments around the world shut down churches. Right. And I can tell you in Australia, the majority of churches in the country have been shut down by the government since March 2020. Last year, the Ugh. majority of churches in this country have been shut down, forced, closed by the government since 2020. And it's not like, wow. And, and, and it's not as if, okay, you can still meet in small groups. The, all Christian ministries have been forced shut down. Pastors are not allowed to visit their parishioners. Um, I mean, it's 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 a complete shutdown of Christian ministry. Just not wild. just of a not just of a Sunday worship of a church with two hundred or more people. Um, this is the majority of church in the country since March two thousand and twenty. Um, well, 
if if churches had a, and, and the churches in Australia have have no clue what to do, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, they, they've no idea what to do. And they had a little bit of reprieve at the end of 2020 when most of the churches were allowed to meet for about a two month period. Um, that's when they should have been saying we need to prepare in case this happens again. Mm-hmm. Um, but they didn't. They don't have a hermeneutic to address to figure out what the Bible actually says in a situation like this. Um, and so when the governments came back at the beginning of 2021 and said, nope, we're shutting you all down again. Um, wow. Well, you know, they, they just complied. Hmm. Um, so now, so I've been working on my own method for application. Um, I can show you if you want, I can even pull up a PowerPoint if you, if you, if you want it, if you honestly, want to. Yeah. <laughs> honestly, that'd be great. You know, um, even, uh, you know, even if this podcast doesn't get up on the, I mean, obviously it's not coming up tomorrow. Today's September 19th, but reflecting on this time in history, this would still be a very relevant thing to cover. And actually we're going through Romans in our church right now. And Mm. uh, we're going to be on Romans 13 in two weeks. And uh, what a very good time to teach a right view of uh, what the Bible says about uh, God's minister of the government and how to Mm -hmm. rightly respond to that minister um, and I'm so curious to hear your thoughts for sure. And I have a lot of thoughts myself just because, you know, I have college students that ask me questions and people that ask me questions and even my own conscience is asking, you know, me questions of just like, how do I think through this? And, um, you know, I, there's a whole spectrum of people that are like, you know, um, that are from the perspective of they're being tyrannical. We need to rebel in the right way, you know, in a, in a Christian way, you know. Uh, Mm -hmm. not necessarily use of force, you know, kind of thing, although there might be warrant for that in some way in the future. Um, Like you have the American revolution that happened and some people say, well, that's wrong. The American revolution happened. Um, But um, you know, I'm one of those those people. Oh yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I said, as an American, I disagree. Uh, But uh, no, but uh, I was uh, reading. um, uh, What was it? Uh, I mean, slaying Leviathan by Glenn sunshine has really, influence some of my thinking on this too and just the development of uh rights and liberties over church history and how the early church handled it and man there could be a lot there to talk about but just uh francis schaefer i just found this book in my library and i'm just like wow uh it's called a christian manifesto and obviously it is a response in some ways to the communist manifesto mm-hmm. and so i i just i i have so many things i i'm like trying to dive into i, I just recently bought uh, the Vindicie Contra Tyrannus and uh, Lex Rex, Sammy Rutherford, got a few other books here. And I'm just like, I want to know what people are saying on a wide spectrum. And then there's other side who are like Australia to some degree and the church is there of like, we will do whatever the government says. And for me, I guess that's where I kind of have a problem. And I want to hear your thoughts on that. Just of like, you know, um, people are just kind of bowing to the government and um, doing exactly what they say And I'm not advocating for a, um, and I just got to be careful how I word it here, Uh, but I'm not advocating for an all out rebellion, right? And like grab your torch and pitchforks kind of thing. But I think there should be some righteous resistance in this sense. And every time we think resistance, some people immediately just go to violence. That's not true. You can resist in a way that's civil disobedience, which means you will disobey, but you will accept the consequences of disobedience. You know, um, what are some thoughts you just have on, on, on that? Maybe start with actually some of the things you're about to bring up with your slide in Australia. Well, I'll just say, I think uh, broadly speaking, we, we praise the underground churches in China. (laughs) We praise the underground churches behind the iron curtain or iron wall when it was up. Um, I don't, I don't understand if, if what they were doing is right, and I've never heard a Christian pastor through all my education, I've never heard anyone say what they are doing is wrong. Um, I don't see much different between, between what China is doing to the church and what Australia is currently doing to the church. Hmm. Um, I don't see much difference. So I, I think the churches should have moved underground a long time ago, as in, in 2020, the churches should have moved underground. You don't need the building. You know, yeah. have yeah. to meet in a building, abandon the building. Who cares? Yeah. Um, I think they they should have still met because there's an explicit command within my 
methodological framework and hermeneutical framework that says you have to meet on a regular basis. Um, and so that's God's law trumps, trumps man's law. Uh, and so I think the church should have moved underground a long time ago. In, instead, uh, what I'm hearing is we need to obey the government in, in everything that it says. And, you know, and, and, the, and, and the flip side is because of the help of the people and so forth. And the flip, the flip, the flip side is throughout all my degrees, my bachelor's, my master's, a lot less than my PhD, but through conversations with people on PhD, it's but definitely my bachelor's and my master's degree, which are all in theology. We, we praise those missionaries that went into disease-ridden places and put their lives at line to minister to people at risk to themselves. Yeah. But here we're, we're, we're too afraid to do that. Yeah. The pastors are too afraid to do that. The Christians are too afraid to do that. We're, we're too afraid of getting sick and dying. And I'm like, mm. well, that, that's not the biblical worldview. A, a Christian worldview, should, nobody should be afraid of dying. Um, mm. If we're healthy and we're not sick, then we should be, we should go ahead and minister re regardless. Hmm. Um, and so I think the church should have resisted a long time ago. Um, we finally have found a church that uh, my state has some reprieve at the moment. Uh, we finally found a church that does have a mechanism to go underground as soon as the government puts us in another lockdown, um, which is inevitable in our area. I'm hmm. in the state of Queensland. Um, as soon as the borders open up again, we'll be, we'll be in lockdown. Uh, the state borders I'm talking about right now, nobody's allowed in our state at all. Even wow. resident, even residents who wow. leave our state or who left our state, even if they wanted to come back, even after the, the, the lockdown, the, 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 the border lockdown was, was, was put in place, state residents are not allowed back. Wow. You're not allowed back. So your, your house, your livelihood might be here. It is illegal to come into the state and it is active patrol at every entry point. Um, nobody can come in um, into our state at all. Well, I mean, um, is in the, in the Australian constitution, does it mention rights to private property? Uh, yes. Or is it presupposed at least? It's more presupposed. We, we have okay. certain rights. So we're socialist over here. Like we are hardcore uh, socialist. And so, yeah, the, the government has a lot of control over over a lot and so and our state is one of the freest states at the present time uh, we came out of lockdown a month ago um, our last lockdown ended a month ago um, but but the state borders and the national borders the country have been shut for for a long time uh, so mm. we are very much yeah and it, it, it's really it's really bad unless you're rich and famous then you can come and go as you want to oh, you know. yeah yeah the but, oligarchy uh, yeah. but you know i think about um you bringing up us praising people. And remember Dr. Kent Brantley? I don't know if you remember that name or not. Ooh. He got um, a lot of headlines in 2014 when he was a missionary to Africa and he got Ebola and he was trying to, he was a medical missionary trying yes. to trying to help people. And of course the news praised him as being stupid, being about, you know, trying to be around disease people, but Christians everywhere were like, this guy's the man, like he's laying down his life. He's willing to even get this crazy virus, lay down his life. And he almost dies. I mean, they had to take him back to the state so he could be worked on. Uh, and he survives the virus. Yeah. And I just remember the interviews he would get. He worked for Samaritan's Purse even. Just like, you know, this guy, I mean, we sang his praises. But I wonder today if it was COVID instead. And with the media response, would everyone condemn Dr. Kent Brantley? Yeah, I, I think I think they would. I think most, most, most would. And we saw churches attacking each other. And this is where, to circle back to hermeneutics. Yeah. We saw churches and Christians attacking one another for their response to the lockdowns, especially in America. So I'm talking more about America here. Only yeah. a couple of churches resisted here and the government swooped in and, and put a hard stop to any church that was resisting. Wow. Um, and, but it was really sad because I was like, don't you all realize that, it's, it is a hermeneutical issue. <laughs> yeah. You're all interpreting the Bible differently. And especially in the United States, the situation was different for a lot of states. Like some states, you're, you're okay, you just can't meet if you're 200 plus people, but you can meet in small groups and still and so forth. Other states and, and areas, no, it was no ministry whatsoever. You can't go to other people's houses and so forth. Right. Um, so if, if you don't mind me sharing the screen. Um, yeah, go ahead. You'll need to enable that. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it right yeah. now. Yeah. So multiple yeah, participants can share the screen. So maybe it should be doing it now. 
All right. Yes. So I'm super happy for this to come out. And uh, I want to write a book on biblical application. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, so this is sort of the beginnings, the big, the big picture. There are more, more there, are, there are other nuanced issues we could talk about. But essentially, are you able to see it? Yeah, I see it clearly. All right. So, so essentially, I've, I've dubbed it the salvation historical application method. Okay. <laughs> Um, this is the fifth method. So in my, my hermeneutics class, we, we go through five different methods okay. of application that are somewhat common. Um, and I, I ended with mine. So I think the starting point is determining the text's place in salvation history. Now, that's a technical term that we don't have the time to explain. But essentially, um, God is working out his salvation plan throughout real history, throughout our history. And this is traced throughout all the scripture. Obviously, um, you could either, you could say climaxing in, in Jesus's death, resurrection, and ascension. You could say culminating in um, the new heavens and the new earth, depending on your, your eschatology. That might be right when Jesus comes back, or it might be after the thousand years. But there, yeah. there are segments. I, 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 I want to refrain from the term dispensations because... Yeah of the loaded nature you could call them dispensations but there are the te each text is referring to a different a, a point in salvation history okay um and just because it's in the old testament doesn't necessarily mean it's not about our place in salvation history the easy example is jeremiah 31 31 through 34 which talk explicitly talks about the new covenant well that text is right. talking about not the present time in salvation history in which jeremiah was writing but a future time in salvation history so um, and then you've got to determine what to do with Psalms and Proverbs, which we can talk about later. So once you've determined the text place in salvation history, to which place is it referring? Then you move on to your place in salvation history. Where am I at in God's salvation plan? Hmm. So from what I understand, we are, we are um, in the new covenant. So I'm under the new covenant. That's the only covenant that I'm under. Or you could also say the Abrahamic covenant because Romans makes that very clear. Yeah. Um, since you guys are going through Romans, you've been through chapters three and four already. Yep. Um, um, I'm also a part of the kingdom of God. Jesus has made it very clear. He inaugurated the kingdom of God and anyone who becomes his disciple um, uh, uh, is part of that kingdom of God. Granted, the kingdom hasn't been consummated yet, but it is certainly inaugurated. And we are considered citizens of that kingdom now, right. which is going to dictate how we act. And we're also disciples of Jesus. So You've got to have a clear understanding of our place in salvation history. And I think the three most important are um, uh, we're under the new covenant, we're part of the kingdom of God, and we're part of the church, if I, if I can put it that way. I yeah. think at the very least. And if you want to add disciple of Jesus, I think that's important as well. Okay. Um, then texts that align with your place in salvation history are going to be much more likely to be applicable. Okay. And I think this is really the starting point. This is okay. This text is speaking about it is speaking about my place in salvation history. So there's a good chance it's going to be applicable to me and my life and my church. Um, then the next step is to distinguish the indicative from uh, the imperative. The indicative being just a statement, or, 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 you know, a, a saying or a statement, what happened or what was said. Um, and an imperative is a command or an exhortation to do something. So then we sort of have a split. Um, and so what do we do for the imperative? Well, to apply the imperative to ourselves, we need to distinguish universal commands versus people, time, and place sensitive commands. Now, when we, when we get into this phase, my understanding of the role of the 12 apostles, the apostles of Jesus becomes very important. Um, uh, in Matthew 28 and in John 14 and, and 15, I think it's pretty clear that the role of the apostles is to teach all the disciples of Jesus, both in their day and beyond, um, what Jesus expects of them, of all the future disciples. So my understanding of all of the, of the entire New Testament, my understanding is every book in the New Testament is either written by an apostle or uh, is associated with an apostle, has that apostolic authority. Right. Therefore, when it comes to the letters of the church, uh, so Romans through to Revelation, if a command is given to a church, then it is for all 
all churches, all disciples of Jesus of all time, because it's referring to all of those people within the same place in salvation history in which I am. Hmm. So even though I'm 2000 years later, this is these commands to the church are for, um, are for those who are disciples of Jesus, who are members of the church, who are under the new covenant and part of the kingdom of God. Well, that's me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I take all of that as applying to, to me and the church, unless it singles out an individual person. And then I need to determine from the text is what is said to this person. Does the text indicate it's also for me? For example, second Timothy, um, Paul says, everything I'm telling you teach to all of the, the leaders in the church so that they can teach everybody else. Right. So everything that's told to Timothy is going to be, uh, about how to live and behave and so forth is actually going to be applicable to all the people or, or Christians or people who are members of a church under the new covenant, part of the kingdom of God. Hmm. Same with time and place sensitive ones. Is this command specifically for this period in time? Um, is it for something in this location? And I'm putting the onus or the burden on the biblical text to tell me that. So hmm. I, I don't like arguments from silence. So if the text does not tell me this is restricted to a certain person, time, or place, then it is for, for my period in salvation history, and therefore for me. Then we need to answer the when of the cultural argument. And so lots of people like to dismiss the portions of the Bible they don't like based right. on, well, this was for that, that, for that culture. Um, my understanding is because the Bible is the word of God, because the apostles, their job is to instruct the people in this period in salvation history, how to live as disciples, both what to believe and what to do and how to behave. If something that they were saying was limited to that first century Greco-Roman and or Jewish culture, then because the Bible is for all of God's people of all time, and these commands are for all of God's people um, during the, the apostles are for this period of time, then the apostles inspired by the Holy spirit would have actually said something in the text. This is relegated to this culture. So hmm. I need something in the text to tell me this is relegated to the present culture, um, to the first century culture. And therefore it is, there's no authority over me today and my culture. Um, and then you go to a one-to-one -one application, one-to-one -one ratio, whatever it says you do. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that, 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 goes away from the idea of principalization. Um, there are commands that are principles. Love your neighbor like yourself. Yep. That's, a, that's a principle right there. It's a command, but, it, but, but it's, it's a principle command. Okay, then I need to figure out how I actually go ahead and do that. But there are other commands um, that are explicitly, that are very explicit and, and very clear. And we should, we should do those things exactly as the text says and not try to get around it by saying, well, we'll just take the principle behind it. Hmm. Um, and then, of course, when you get to the indicative, um, so, for instance, the book of Acts is, is, is going to be a common one. Um, we need to recognize that all indicative texts are descriptive. Um, so they're not commands. They're just simply telling us right. what was said or what was done. Hmm. Um, then we need to look for textual indicators that suggest or preferably state what was being described as extraordinary not normative or um the roman numeral uh, three look for the textual indicators that state what is being described is normative for christians and the church i think this is really important for the book of acts especially yeah um then we need to determine whether we as christians or the church depending on whether you're trying to figure out is this how the church should operate or is this what the christians should do no there's not always a distinction but sometimes there is um do we need to determine whether we are able to do the things being described? So, for example, the early church met in a temple. Well, we just can't do that because there is no temple. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and there's also a theological reason we don't need to, of course, as well, because we are the temple. Um, but again, this is sort of the bare bones. Yeah. Um, then we need to ask ourselves, do Jesus and the letters of the New Testament um, encourage people within our place in salvation history to do these things. If they do, um, then we apply it at a one-to-one -one ratio. So if the text suggests or states it's normative, um, if we're able to do it, and if Jesus and all the New Testament letters encourage believers to do it, 
um, then I think the text is normative and Christians um, and all the church should actually adopt the practice at a, at a one-to-one ratio. Hmm. Uh, and so that's sort of the, the bare bones, the bare yeah. bones of it. This becomes really important, especially when reading the gospels, because we need to recognize that Jesus came under the old covenant. The new covenant was not established or ratified until his death. Yeah. And really not until the Holy spirit came. Are we, are, are we a part of, is, was anybody a part of the new covenant? It was ratified at his death, but nobody was ushered into the kingdom or the new covenant until um, his, his ascension and, and the giving of the Holy spirit. So when it comes to the gospels, we need to say, okay, is Jesus actually talking and telling us about what is to come about this new period in salvation history, or is he reinforcing the, the covenant under which he is, um, you know, the Sinai covenant um, and so forth. And so a lot of attention, there's a lot of abuse in the gospel. Um, There's just a lot of abuse in the gospel saying people applying things that shouldn't be applied to Christians or, or not applying things that, that, that should be uh, even as going so far you've probably heard this before of uh equating the christians to the apostles in the uh, mm. the faithlessness especially of the apostles in in the gospels mm. i'm like you should never equate christians to the to the apostles in the gospels because they didn't have the holy spirit and you do <laughs> that's right yeah no, that's if good. anything you equate christians to the apostles in the book of acts Hmm. because now they have the Holy Spirit, just like you have the Holy Spirit. Now they're operating in the same period in salvation history as you are. They, previously, they were, they were not operating under the, the same period. They don't have the Holy Spirit and so forth. So um, I think if churches were to adhere to something like this, they would be able to say, okay, what does the Bible say? And I know how to determine what to apply. And in the case of the COVID, of the church closures, I would also say an explicit command trumps a, a principle. Right. Well, I heard some people saying, uh, judging MacArthur's church for meeting when he was going to Hebrews chapter 10, which, which commands Christians to continue meeting together. And at that period in time, it wasn't just that they couldn't have big church meetings. They were banned from, he was banned from going to people's house, to his parishioners' houses and ministering to them. Small yeah. groups were banned from meeting together. Yeah. Um, and so he said, there's an explicit command from Jesus because in his bibliology, and I agree, Jesus inspired all of scripture, even if he wasn't, even if it didn't come from his mouth, like in the gospels, in the book of right. Hebrews. And they would say, that's why we're doing it. Whereas Andy Stanley's church adopted the principle. They decided to keep their church closed Yep. even after they were allowed to open because right. they under, they thought that was loving to their neighbor. So they were taking the command to love thy neighbor, which is in my opinion, in my opinion, more of a principle. Um, and so they would say, no, I'm not saying any Stanley, his church were criticizing MacArthur, but I did hear this a lot in the Twitterverse, yeah. um, in the social media. I heard a lot. Well, and even over here, a lot of people are like, we should be close because it's loving our neighbor. We should be close because it's loving. It's not loving to meet together. And it's not loving for healthy congregations who do not have the virus to meet together because even though they're healthy and they don't have the virus, they might still spread the virus. <laughs> uh, that's exactly what they would say. Because yeah. I would be like, well, what if they're all healthy and then nobody's sick? Well, they still might spread it. I'm like, but they don't have it. Well, they still might spread it. It's not, it's not, it's not loving your neighbor. And so for me, I would say, well, if we loving your neighbor, that's, it's a command, but how do we love our neighbor in this situation? Yeah, we, I, I, You could make a good argument and then I'll let you talk. Sorry. No, you can make a good. really good argument that, that the person who hasn't had any human contact in two or three months, who's commi- convincing, committing suicide, it's loving that person going in and just hanging out with them for the day. Yeah. It's loving telling people about Jesus and going mm-hmm. and giving hope to, to the people who are scared, who are dying and so forth. You can make a good argument that that is loving mm. as well as, yes, it's, it's also loving if I am contagious, not to stay, it's loving for me to stay at home. So I, I get that. But the point is to say that a church that is ministering to its people and its community is unloving. I think you're going to be hard pressed to show that when I think it's going to be a pretty easy case to say, well, actually that that is showing love and exhibiting love. Yeah. I, yeah. 
I'm just so shocked by even that argument about, well, you know, if you want to love your neighbor, wear your mask, or if you want to love your neighbor, do that. But it's like, you could be a completely healthy person who's already had the virus antibodies, even let's just say someone's vaccinated, all these kind of things. Like we could go on all these different routes. And it's just shocking to me that they make that argument. Well, love your neighbor by not doing the things the Bible commands you to do, like meeting together, encouraging one another. There's so much in the Bible, just even about helping people and um, helping the weaker brothers. Like uh, in James, it says, you know, lift the drooping hands and your, your weak knees. I might be taken out of context, but it's the first verse that came to my mind. Uh, but the faint hearted, you hear about the faint hearted being encouraged, like encourage the faint hearted. And you got to think in this time with so much isolation and you, you mentioned suicide, the suicide rates up everywhere. Yeah. You know, it's like people are faint hearted. They're worn out from this whole thing and they need to be loved. And, and maybe loving my neighbors saying, you know what? I could get this virus. I could maybe get it running into someone or walking by someone but that person's going to kill themselves. <clears throat> and if I just get sick and I end up being fine afterwards, I, maybe even I end up hospitalized, but I end up being fine. But I love that person sacrificially. You know, that's, that's real love laying down yeah. your life for somebody, even taking the risk and kind of going back to Dr. Kent Brantley. He took the risk to save Ebola patients, sharing the gospel with them too, and almost lost his own life. I just feel like we worship health and we worship safety. And it, it's weird. Even the guys who would rail against prosperity theology, they almost do it. They almost live prosperity theology and practice about how much they focus on health. And although they'll say, and I, maybe that's a bad criticism. I mean, you could correct me if you think so. I think some, I don't know if I go so far as to say most, but I think it's certainly some for sure. Yeah. I just, I think about, you know, of like, like, guys at, like the gospel coalition or other places who were just like like man you the mandates are good vaccine mandates are good and mask mandates are good and all these kind of things and they're emphasizing it in such a way where it just it just bewilders me i, I, I don't i don't know how to put it just it, it just shocks me when they'll deny like meeting together you mentioned like andy stanley and others i know he's not tgc or anything but um yeah, yeah and i wasn't saying um i was just i wasn't saying any, that he was saying anything bad or whatnot. It was just a good example of here's the approach that his church took, and he was out, outspoken about it. Here's the approach that MacArthur took. They took, they both grant tried to grind, grind, try to grind, try to ground it in scripture. Right. Um, but for me, I just think if you have an explicit command that sort of actually, especially it's kind of addressing the situation, then then that trumps the principle. So That's at right. least the command that is a, a that is principle in nature. So, yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I'm trying to I get mean, my train of thought back about the prosperity theology comment I made. I can't, I can't get sorry. my thought back. No, it's okay. I, it's my fault, but I, I just, I'm, I, I didn't want to overspeak what I was saying. And I felt like I did, but I just think that, like I said, we worship health in such a way where we, we actually stop worshiping God. We worship humanity and our safety versus, you know, worshiping God and taking risk. I guess it's kind of my point where it's like, yeah. we're not supposed to treasure the things of this earth at times. We should be good stewards. Yes. That's a biblical, you could say principle, but at the same time, we should, we, our faith takes risks too. And that's kind of what you're going back to about the underground church and these kind of things. And it's like, while we might deny prosperity theology with our lips, sometimes I think this pandemic has shown to some degree in some people and the issue of health in particular, that they might be, you know, expecting that this is the principle we should live by and be healthy and focus on that to such a degree where we deny explicit commands in scripture. I guess that's what I was trying to say. Yeah, I guess put the same, same idea, put maybe a different, a different way. Uh, for many of, of the listeners, they might not know that the term for worship um, that's translated worship in both the Old Testament and the New Testament can also be uh, translated serve. Right, yes. So, so really worship is serving the lord uh, that's, right. that's really what, what true worship is and the, exactly. we serve him by obeying what he asks of us and, and exactly. so forth so we can look at worship in that sense the question kind of comes down to what will cause me to be disobedient to god or jesus or, or not or what would cause me to not serve him as he has asked me to serve him hmm. when it comes to traditional prosperity prosperity health and wealth um those pastors and preachers are, are being disobedient 
for the purpose of gaining more money. Right. I'm not going to pull, pull, preach the full counsel of God because people aren't going to give as much money. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, to twist scripture or whatnot. I'm, I'm going to be disobedient for money. And the question is, are you being disobedient for health? Is, is mm. that what is causing you to be yeah. disobedient? That's what's causing you to not serve the Lord as you should be serving him as set for uh, in, in scripture. So yeah, in, in a sense, it's, it is like the prosperity gospel. It's just, what are you trying to gain? Uh, prosperity gospel, you're usually trying to gain wealth um, and or fame. Whereas right. here, you're trying to gain health. <laughs> yeah, gain, or right. we might even say maintain Ma- a status mm, yes. of health. That's yes. like, it's, it's good to be healthy. We should take care of ourselves. The apostle Paul says bodily training is of some value, right? So yeah. it's good to, to make sure we take care of ourselves, but not at the expense of disobedience to the commands of Christ yeah. uh, and his word. So, yeah, man, I think, you know, I think we hit on a good point here in the end and just in wrapping things up, you know, I called this podcast at the crossroads because, you know, I want people to really walk away from every podcast kind of making a decision about what they're going to what they're going to do from having heard what we talked about and and some things that you know i think were really helpful in particular application like going that route you're right a lot of people don't talk about it and a lot of books don't talk about it um they might give some stuff to it but sometimes it's just kind of foggy you know um so i really do appreciate that one thing that i've learned being going to like g3 expository preaching workshops is we we talk about the square and in the square, you start at the text, and then you go to the context of the passage, and then you do like theological reflection. So it could be on Christ uh, in this text, or where we see mankind in this text, or sin, or the nature of God, or you know, just whatever biblical themes might pop up. And then from there, you go to application, and then mm-hmm. that application therefore brings you back to the to the text. So you're going to want the main idea of the text as it relates to the author and his intent for the original audience. And then by the end of the sermon, you'll, you know, formulate something from that main idea of the text and say the main idea for the audience today. Um, and, and so I, f- I found that really helpful, but I think you're right. Um, often what I try to do in my preaching is I, I, I think, well, there's only two kinds of people, those who are in Adam and in Christ. And so I shape my application to say, well, how would this passage apply to an unbeliever? And how does this passage apply to a believer? You know, yeah. um, and so that's kind of how, often shape my application and i feel like it's general enough but it also can allow you to be specific in some ways too especially if the text is going that way but um man just in closing um you know would you add anything further just if people are trying to make a decision about how to respond to critical theory or rightly applying the word anything else you want to add to that just of really what should they go and do from here it's kind of an action step yes i think the, there's really two things that that everybody should do. The first is is figure out what the Bible is, and figure out what level of authority it has over you and your church. I think that's that's the first place to start, and then begin working toward developing a consistent. And that's probably the key word: a consistent method for applying scripture. And a good way to start is, okay, take some of the things that you're doing that you know the Bible talks about and figure out how did I, how did I come to this decision? How, how did I, so I'll ask my students, okay, um, I don't care if you are pro-homosexuality or, or, or anti-homosexuality. Um, I mean, I do care, but for this exercise, tell me where you're at and tell me how you came to that decision. And, and a lot of the time, it's it's not very thought out. So so take some maybe some of these hot button topics, you know, right. these big issues, um, women in leadership, homosexuality. Even take some fun ones, the, you know, holy kiss, head covering or, or not covering your head while praying, um, and even some some fun ones from the Old Testament, what not. And say, okay, I I currently am or am not doing what the Bible says. Start with the actual commands. That's the easiest place. To start with an actual command and figure out, okay well, what is my method? How am I currently determining whether I should do this or not? Because I guarantee you there's some commands in the Bible you're not doing. Why are you not doing them? And then begin to formulate a method where you can be consistent and use what I put on the screen as a good starting place. Start reading books about it. Um, What books would you recommend? There's not many. (laughs) This is a... 
<laughs> brother, this is a terrible, um, a terrible area. I'll, 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 I got one in back here. Let me get it real quick because I'm going to get the name wrong. Um, that has one of the more developed methods. I don't agree with this method, but it certainly has one of the more um, developed uh, method. Like, give me, a, give me a minute. Yeah. I'll, I'll get it. Yeah, go for it. It's loaned out at the moment, but I, <laughs> I know I've I've got it written down here. Okay. Um, somewhere. It's actually in a, a hermeneutics textbook. It's a really large one. Okay. Um, but hold on. It's the Principalization method. So it's in, it's entitled Introduction to Biblical Interpretation. Okay. Uh, it's chapter twelve, and the it's a there's three authors: William Klein, Craig Blomberg, and Robert Hubbard. So Klein, Blomberg, and Hubbard they have a chapter. I think it's about fifty pages long. Okay. Um, going through a method uh, of application. Their method is the principalization method. I don't okay. like that method. Um, it has some weaknesses. They basically say, figure out the principle of every passage okay. and then figure out how that principle works its way out in your culture. I see. And is it too to subjective? Me, it becomes because you're trying to figure out how the, for, for number, so number one, you could ignore the actual command because it, looking at the principle behind the command and essentially you can, you can bring in the cultural argument really easily um, which I think is used too often. And basically you can say, okay, this is the principle. It was, it worked its way out. That is based on the command or even the statement. It's worked its way out in the culture, either the first century culture or, or earlier, if it's the oldest, it's worked its way out in the culture in this way. How does it work its way out in the culture today? Let me, now this is not where they go, but this is taking that principle to the extremes. I can say, okay, Paul prohibits homosexual behavior. Hmm. Um, well, that's because in his, in his Jewish culture, and this actually is used by a denomination, in his Jewish culture, homosexual, homosexual behavior is wrong. Um, therefore, um, his, his idea was, what's the principle behind no homosexuality? Well, love is the idea behind it. Um, and they would say homosexuality in the first century was dominance-based um there and there's real people have argued it. it's dominance yeah. based um in today's society there is there is oh, i forgot the net the ter technical term but homosexuality isn't always dominance based there it's 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 true love you know yeah. equality yeah. and all of love that stuff love. so the yeah so the principle behind the no homosexuality revolves around equality and love that's why he he said homosexuality he forbid homosexuality but we can we can actually affirm homosexuality um in our day and age because it's not dominance based now i have, I have some problems with that assumption that it's dominance based um I have, I have some problems with that understanding of homosexuality in the first century right. but you can see sort of how it goes right. um you can almost twist it to mean anything. Basically, you can use this method to affirm whatever you want. If you're wow. imagine if you're imaginative enough. That's a now pretty they, huge they, weakness. Yeah. Now they try to put some limits on it. Um, okay. You know. So so I think. But this is, in my opinion, this is what I see most evangelical and Southern Baptist churches doing. So I was in a Southern Baptist church for the nine years I was studying in Texas. Yeah. Um, and so this is this is what I see most most of the professors at Southwestern doing. This is what I see most churches doing. Um, is is this idea? They don't take it to the extremes that it could be taken to, right? But they certainly use it to 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 not do the things they don't want to do, and do the things that they do want to do. And um, so essentially, the problem becomes that although they may not walk through those doors that they're opening, it opens the way for their their parishioners, the church members to, if they're going to apply this principalization method and look at the culture and say, well, now apply this to your culture. Well, it's essentially, if we talk, if we're going back to this whole 
superstructure and hegemony thing, right? Our cultures mm-hmm. change so much where it's like, if you don't affirm LGBTQ plus or Black Lives Matter or feminism, you know, a woman's right to choose to, to murder her uh, unborn baby, like these different things. If you don't affirm that, then you're, you know, you're kind of canceled or you're, you know, you're not following the culture. And so it's like, it's kind of become more counterculture in that sense, but uh, Christianity, but you leave the door open to say, well, I apply this to your culture. Even, even though I would say all those guys would, at least most of those guys, sorry, would not affirm that you should go that far, but that's the weakness. Yeah. I, I think the best example of this that I just, I don't know why I didn't go to it before is whether women can be pastors or teach men in the church. Okay. I'll, I mean, this Let's is talk even about that. A, so so this is one area of frustration for churches especially congregants who are like well i don't understand the bible we do a lot of what the bible says but or or we don't do some of what the bible says but when it comes to this issue right here you're telling me that i for women i can't be a pastor or i can't be an elder or i can't preach or teach i don't understand why you're coming to this conclusion when you're concluding other things are cultural and there are so many churches around the world that have said the women leadership is cultural. And, um, and, and I think Southern Baptists are struggling with it mm-hmm. because there, there's, there's a trend now that Queensland Baptists have, have affirmed women can be elders. They split. They said women can be elders, but they can't be pastors. Now, the Bible, I think, is pretty clear that pastor, elder, and bishop slash overseer are all referring to the same one office. Um, But they've split it and said women can be elders and they can have rule and authority over the church of men. They just can't be shepherds and preach on a Sunday morning. But a lot of Southern Baptist churches I've seen are in the process of simply just going away from biblical terminology um, and saying, well, we've got this woman isn't a pastor or an elder or a bishop or overseer. She's a minister or a director <laughs> or a director yeah. um and so now you've got so so this comes back to okay well does the bible the new testament let's just say new testament does the new testament have authority over how the church over church polity the pastor of my church in the in the u.s um i went to two churches one through my master's degree and one through my doctorate and the one the last one i was a member of i loved the church it, but the best church I've been a part of, but I took, we were becoming a, he was transitioning to become a plurality of elders. So he was changing the church policy. I affirm a plurality of elders. I thought it was a great move. Um, but there were some issues that I had with it. And we met up for lunch and I said, I don't understand what you're doing is against what I see. I, I, it was either against what I see scripture doing, or it doesn't allow you to make this move. Um, oh, I remember what it was. He said, he said, not all pastors are going to be elders. So you're going to have some who are pastors, but not elders, some who are elders, but not pastors, and some who are elders and pastors. And I was like, mm, that's not even what you preach the Bible said. And he's like, yeah. well, I don't believe that the Bible um, it has, is, is fully authoritative over church polity and church structure. I believe it's a guideline, but we can basically do whatever we want. And this is what I've seen in a lot of Southern Baptist churches wow. as well. And it's one way that the, the church is, a, is, is, a, is getting around this no women teaching, preaching, yeah. having authority over men thing is we're just creating our own roles and reserving the biblical ones to men, the bib- pastors and elders, but we're creating. And this is what this major church in my friend's state did, not my friend's church, but um, this major Southern Baptist church in my friend's state, Tennessee, um they they hired and created a position with the title minister and this this woman was a major position had shepherding authority and duties over men in the church Hmm. and the church was called out on i felt really bad for the poor woman i don't know if she knew what she was getting into um the church was basically saying the the description of this position is a description of a shepherd as the bible puts forth wow you've just changed the name yeah and that's pretty much what they had done in my opinion but it, but lots of churches i've seen um have, have done that and again it comes down to it's the struggle between culture and principalization and the idea of well 
is what are the commands that Paul and Peter and John and the apostles have given are the commands just how they're working at their faith at in their day and age. Hmm. If it is, then it no longer has authority over us in our day and age because we're definitely in a different culture. Right. Um, that's why I like my method a little bit more is because it puts the onus on the biblical text to say whether or not what is being spoken of and commanded of people in the new covenant, part of the kingdom of God and part of the church, um, it puts the onus on the biblical text to say whether or not this is limited to the first century culture. And wow. you'll be surprised that there's not a lot. <laughs> yeah. the, the New Testament does not does not limit a lot because they're giving, they're telling all of God's people for this period in salvation history, how they are to live. And I would actually say that's the cultural issue right there. Hmm. That the, What is the culture? It's talking about the culture of the church. Right. Hmm. And that that's the culture. If, if yeah. you want to use that terminology. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're still well within that culture that is being in which the commands are being given um in in the new testament but the church and including some of the baptist churches i've got a real problem with 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 this issue of women having authority because most evangelical denominations and that evangelical is a broad term here most have affirmed women can be elders and have authority over the church and teach men most of them have yeah southern baptists independent baptists and some presbyterian churches yeah are sort of the the, the ones who are the last remaining churches have said, no, this is the biblical way to do it. Yeah. And we're going to, we're going to adhere to it. Um, I just, but I see Southern Baptists breaking on this point as well. I fully agree with you. And, and even just watching a lot of the NAM church plants they kind of put out, you know, North American mission board. And uh, you know, you look at, you know, just all the revelations there that have taken place with like church plants who have women preaching on Sunday morning on a regular basis or yeah. even or even every quarter or every few months, you know, and you're just like, you know, Southern Baptist cooperative program dollars are paying for all this. And uh, it just, it's, it's really sad. And then when you, when you try and say something about it, you know, you're, you're seen as being divisive, it's, but it's like, wait, but this is what we stand for this is what we believe. It's not divisive just to point out, Hey, this is what we believe. Why is this not being practiced? You know um, of course, if it was an abuse situation, they'd be like, yeah, let's call that out. But if it's, you know, if it's a doctrinal issue in this sense, you know, and I'm all for yeah. saying we should rightly call out abuse, of course. But, you know, it's yeah. you think about, you know, this, it's, it just seems inconsistent. And, it, and I want to kind of go to that text. And I, I know we can't talk all day, uh, but uh, I think about um, just that passage in First Timothy. And I just a plain reading of scripture. It just doesn't make sense that people dismiss that and just say it's cultural to me. Just because he this Paul, Paul's rationale is rooted in the creation order. And which is not his own culture. So he's rooted it in a culture vastly different from his own, which should be an indicator that this is not based on his first century Greco-Roman Jewish culture. Exactly. And I, I like, I just, the, the gymnastics that they do, it's, it's, it's almost Olympic style gymnastics, except for they just don't get the gold. Uh, you know, they're, it's, they're doing all these flips and turns and twists. And I just don't understand you know, even some good old friends of mine from my seminary days who have kind of compromised on this. And I'm like, you know, what do we learn in class? And what are we learning? But again, you know? but it comes back to a poor method of application. And, and the perfect example was when we had church meetings about this in my SBC church in the US, a lady stood up in, in meeting. She was allowed to. She was, she was given the, the mic and she said, I don't, for one, she didn't have any method for hermeneutic for, for interpreting. She said, I just don't agree with this. I think women should be allowed to be elders. And the response from the head pastor, which was cringeworthy, it was, it was said with love and grace, but it was, well, the Bible just tells us that women cannot be pastors, or cannot be elders, and we're going to do what the Bible says. I agree that we do what the Bible says, but he didn't but he didn't explain why we were why we adhere to this text and this no. command, but not a whole host of others. There was no method to explain this is the proper way to interpret and apply scripture, and we are being consistent in our method. Instead, it was this is what the Bible says, and we're just going to do it. Yeah. Then why no don't you do everything? No explanation. Yeah. Especially, well, why don't you do everything the Bible says? Our church has lots of things our church doesn't do that the Bible says, and this woman would have known that even yeah. if it was more subconscious. Um, 
And, and so again, this it, it's, it's incumbent and it's necessary for pastors and churches and denominations to have a method hmm. um, that is well worked out so we can fall back on it and say, unless you can prove my method is faulty from scripture, we're going to do it even if we don't like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because we recognize that if we don't like it, it's most likely because the flesh that is that that will not be done away with until yeah. we get our resurrection bodies. It's probably because our flesh doesn't like it and our flesh. There's no good that dwells in our flesh, according to Paul in, in Romans seven. There's no good that dwells in it. And so it naturally is going to be standoffish for the commands of, mm-hmm. of, of scripture. And so we're not going to give in to that feeling. We're not going to give in to our flesh. We're going to do what the Bible says because we've got a consistent methodology that is derived from scripture and has a biblical basis and foundation. And, um, and so in the, and that moves the conversation away from you're a homophobe, yeah, yep. <laughs> you know, to, well, hold on. Let's the conversation now comes down to what's your method of applying scripture. What's your hermeneutic. And it allow it, it takes a lot of the heatedness out of conversations Right. Um, and allows people to say, okay, I can see where you're coming from on this. Right. Um, even if I don't agree with it in the end, I, I can see where you're coming from. Right. Man, that, that's great. And, uh, you know, I think this is a good place to end the conversation. Uh, but I definitely, I want to have you back because I want to talk COVID with you. COVID Australia, we'll call it, you know, we, we probably have to like avoid the YouTube algorithm by like, you know, making it all number spelling and stuff like that. So the whole yeah. can- channel doesn't get canceled, but um, you know, it's just a, a interesting, the oppression uh, uh, from government and the tyranny. And so let's definitely, you know, I want to have you back on and we'll talk about that more in the future and even we'll get to revisit some of these things. So maybe we'll talk Romans 13, COVID, <laughs> Australia, yes. America, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll make a persuasive case to make you like the American revolution. We'll see. Uh, but uh, you I'm know, an American brother. citizen, by the way. Just, oh. just, just I'm, I'm a dual, I'm a dual citizen. Well, do we, um, so. do we need to send like a rescue squad to get you out of there, buddy? You know, you're, you're one of us. <laughs> We've looked into it. We can get out if we want to, but if okay. we do, there's no way to get back in. Okay. There's no way to get back in. Australia has 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 closed the doors on its own people abroad and said, if you're you're not back in, at least there was a time where they were letting you come back in, but that timeline yeah. has passed we're not allowed back in if we leave. And so we're not leaving unless we know we're not coming back. <laughs> Are you almost there? I mean, uh, it, it, maybe that's another question for on uh, live, but I, I'm just right. curious, man. I, I just watch what's happening there and I'm like, I don't know how I could live there if they're not letting you do anything and they're keeping you barred. And I mean, maybe some of it's exaggerated, you know, but sometimes My, it's just, wow. I'll, I'll say this for any of that, for any of our listeners, the Australia only has about 25 million people population wise. All right. So we're roughly 25 million. So we're very small. And that population is in basically one, two, three is is just smashed together in five main locations in the whole country. Okay. Yeah. The majority of the population. So whenever you hear the news or I say the majority of Australians are under strict draconian lockdown laws, curfew i mean curfews the works not allowed to go five kilometers from your house only allowed to leave your house to get food or to go to a doctor's appointment not allowed to visit family um, and whatnot that's because the major hubs where the population is located that's what's been shut down and those people are forced within are not allowed to leave um and so forth so if i were to make a map yes the vast majority geographically of the country is not under lockdown but where the people are located, because most of Australia is uninhabitable, and um, where the people are located, that's what is what is happening. In case you look up something, you're like, there's only five cities that are under lockdown. Yeah, that's the majority of the 25 million people. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to spend the news, man. That's that's As pretty it, good. Yeah. So so just in case, it's it's so it's it's a bit different over here in that in that sense. But we'll talk about it later. I just wanted the people to know that who are watching if you've heard something you're like it doesn't sound like that and some of the news i've been heard i've been listening to just understand that aspect about australia population and geography (laughs) well well brother listen uh actually uh, it's it's really part of god's sovereignty that we're meeting even right now but this morning in church we prayed for australia 
um, as a nation. We, we, we pray for a, a different nation every week. Uh, you know, obviously Afghanistan was one recently with everything that's been happening there, but yes. we prayed for you guys today. And, uh, you know, uh, so we'll probably be praying for you again, even more soon. I, but, you know, brother, thank you so much for coming on. And it's, it's it was a really delight to have this great conversation with you and look forward to more in the future. Thanks, Travis. It's been a delight to be on the, uh, on the podcast. Thanks, man.